at last, at daybreak, on a fine February morning, the ceremonial opening of the gates took place, acclaimed by the populace, the newspapers, the radio and official communiques. It only remains for the narrator to give what account he can of the rejoicings that followed, though he himself was one of those debarred from sharing in them wholeheartedly. Elaborate day and night fates were organised, and at the same time smoke began to rise from locomotives in the station, and the ships were already heading for our harbour. Reminders in their diverse ways that this was the long-awaited day of reuniting, and the end of tears for all who had been parted. We can easily picture, at this stage, the consequences of that feeling of separation which had so long rankled in the hearts of so many of our townsfolk. Trains coming in were as crowded as those that left the town in the course of the day. Every passenger had reserved his seat long in advance and had been on tenderhooks during the past fortnight, lest at the last moment the authorities should go back on their decision. Some of these incoming travellers were still somewhat nervous, though as a rule they knew the lot of those nearest and dearest to them. They were still in the dark about the others and the town itself of which their imagination painted a grim and terrifying picture. But this applies only to people who had not been eating their hearts out during the long months of exile, and not to parted lovers. The lovers indeed were wholly wrapped up in their fixed idea, and for them one thing only had changed. Whereas during those months of separation time had never gone quickly enough for their liking, and they were always wanting to speed its flight, now that they were in sight of the town, they would have liked to slow it down and hold each moment in suspense, once the brakes went on and the train was entering the station. For the sensation, confused perhaps, but nonetheless poignant for that, of all those days and weeks and months of the life lost to their love, made them vaguely feel that they were entitled to some compensation. This present hour of joy should run at half speed of those long hours of waiting and the people who awaited them at home or on the platform among the latter rumber whose wife warned in good time had got busy at once and was coming by the first train were likewise fretting with impatience and quivering with anxiety for even rumber felt a nervous tremor at the thought that soon he would have to confront a love and a devotion that the plague months had slowly refined to a pale abstraction with the flesh and blood woman who had given rise to them if only he could put the clock back and be once more the man who, at the outbreak of the epidemic, had had only one thought and one desire, to escape and return to the woman he loved. But that he knew was out of the question now. He had changed too greatly. The plague had forced on him a detachment which, try as he might, he couldn't think away, and which, like a formless fear, haunted his mind. Almost he thought the plague had ended too abruptly. He hadn't had time to pull himself together. Happiness was bearing down on him full speed, the event outrunning expectation. Rumbert understood that all would be restored to him in a flash, and joy break on him like a flame with which there is no dallying. Everyone, indeed, more or less consciously, felt as he did, and it is of all those people on the platform that we wish to speak. Each was returning to his personal life, yet the sense of comradeship persisted and they were exchanging smiles and cheerful glances amongst themselves. But the moment they saw the smoke of the approaching engine, the feeling of exile vanished before an uprush of overpowering, bewildering joy. And when the train stopped, all those interminable seeming separations, which often had begun on this same platform, came to an end in one ecstatic moment when arms closed with hungry possessiveness on bodies whose living shape they had forgotten. As for Rambert, he hadn't time to see that form running towards him. Already she had flung herself upon his breast, and with his arms locked around her, pressing to his shoulder, the head of which he saw only the familiar hair, he let his tears flow freely. Unknowing if they rose from present joy or from sorrow too long repressed, aware only that they would prevent his making sure if the face buried in the hollow of his shoulders were the face of which he had dreamed so often, or, instead, a stranger's face. 
For the moment he wished to behave like all those others around him who believed, or made believe, that plague can come and go without changing anything in men's hearts. Nestling to one another, they went to their homes, blind to the outside world and seemingly triumphant over the plague, forgetting every sadness and the plight of those who had come by the same train and found no one awaiting them, and were bracing themselves to hear in their homes a confirmation of the fear that the long silence had already implanted in their hearts. For these last, who had now for company only their newborn grief, for those who at this moment were dedicating themselves to a lifelong memory of bereavement, for these unhappy people matters were very different. The pangs of separation had touched their climax. For the mothers, husbands, wives and lovers who had lost all joy, now that the loved one lay under a layer of quicklime, in a death pit, always a mere handful of indistinctive ashes in a grey mound, the plague had not yet ended. But who gave a thought to these lonely mourners, rooting the cold floors that had been threshing the air since early morning? The sun was pouring on the town, a steady flood of tranquil light. In the forts on the hills, under the sky of pure, unwavering blue, Guns were thundering without a break, and everyone was out and about to celebrate those crowded moments when the time of ordeal ended and the time of forgetting had not yet begun. In streets, in squares, people were dancing. Within 24 hours the motor traffic had doubled and the ever more numerous cars were held up at every turn by merry-making crowds. Every church bell was in full peal throughout the afternoon and the bells filled the blue and gold sky with their reverberations. Indeed, in all the churches, thanksgiving services were being held, but at the same time the places of entertainment were packed, and the cafes, caring nothing for the morrow, which were producing their last bottles of liquor. A noisy concourse surged around every bar, including loving couples who fondled each other without a thought for appearances. All were laughing or shouting, the reserves of emotion pent up during those many months when, for everybody, the flame of life burned low, were being recklessly squandered to celebrate this, the red letter day of their survival. Tomorrow, real life would begin again, with its restrictions, but for the moment people in very different walks of life were rubbing shoulders, fraternising, the levelling out that death's imminence had failed in practice to accomplish was realised at last for a few gay hours in the rapture of escape. But this rather tawdry exuberance was only one aspect of the town that day. Not a few of those filling the streets at sundown, among them Rumbert and his wife, hid under an air of calm satisfaction and subtler forms of happiness. Many couples Indeed, and many families looked like people out for a casual stroll, no more than that. In reality, most of them were making sentimental pilgrimages to places where they had gone to school with suffering. The newcomers were being shown the striking or obscure tokens of the plague, relics of its passage. In some cases, the survivor merely played the part of guide, the eyewitness who has been through it and talked freely of the danger without mentioning his fear. These were the milder forms of pleasure, little more than recreation. In other cases, however, there was more emotion to these walks about the town, as when a man pointing to some place charged for him with sad yet tender associations would say to the girl or woman beside him, this is where, one evening just like this, I longed for you so desperately and you weren't there. These passionate pilgrims could readily be distinguished. They formed oases of whispers, aloof, self-centred in the turbulence of the crowd. Far more effectively than the bands playing in the squares, they vouched for the vast joy of liberation. These ecstatic couples, locked together, hardly speaking, proclaimed in the midst of the tumult of rejoicing, with the proud egoism and injustice of happy people, that the plague was over, the reign of terror ended. Calmly they denied, in the teeth of the evidence, 
that we had ever known a crazy world in which men were killed off like flies, or that precise savagery that calculated frenzy of the plague, which instilled an odious freedom, as to all, that was not the here and now, or those charnel house stenches which stupefied whom they did not kill. In short, they denied that we had ever been that hag-ridden populace, a part of which was daily fed into a furnace and went up in oily fumes, while the rest, in shackled impotence, waited their turn. That, anyhow, was what seemed evident to Rieu. When, towards the close of the afternoon, on his way to the outskirts of the town, he walked alone in an uproar of bells, guns, bands and deafening shouts, there was no question of his taking a day off. Sick men have no holidays. Through the cool, clear light, bathing the town, rose the familiar smells of roasting meat and anise-flavoured liquor. All around him happy faces were turned towards the shining sky. Men and women with flushed cheeks embraced one another with low, tense cries of desire. Yes, the play had ended with the terror, and those passionately straining arms told what it had meant. Exile and deprivation in the profoundest meaning of the words. For the first time, Rear found that he could give a name to the family likeness that for several months he had detected in the faces in the streets. He had only to look around him now, at the end of the plague, with its misery and privations. These men and women had come to wear the aspect of the part they had been playing for so long, the part of emigrants, whose faces first and now their clothes told of long banishment from a distant homeland. Once plague had shut the gates of the town, they had settled down to a life of separation, debarred from the living warmth that gives forgetfulness of all. In different degrees, in every part of the town, men and women had been yearning for a reunion, not of the same kind for all, but for all alike ruled out. Most of them had longed intensely for an absent one, for the warmth of a body, for love, or merely for a life that habit had endeared. Some, often without knowing it, suffered from being deprived of the company of friends and from their inability to get in touch with them through the usual channels of friendship, letters, trains and boats. Others, few of these, Taru may have been one of them, had desired reunion with something they couldn't have defined, but which seemed to them the only desirable thing on earth. For want of a better name, they sometimes called it peace. Ryu walked on. As he progressed, the crowds grew thicker. The din multiplied, and he had a feeling that his destination was receding as he advanced. Gradually he found himself drawn into the seething, clamorous mass, and understanding more and more the cry that went up from it. A cry that, for some part at least, was his. Yes, they had suffered together, in body no less than in soul, from a cruel leisure, exile without redress, thirst that was never slaked, among the heaps of corpses, the clanging bells of ambulances, the warnings of what goes by the name of fate, among unremitting waves of fear and agonised revolt, the horror that such things could be, always a great voice had been ringing in the ears of those forlorn, panicked people, a voice calling them back to the land of their desire, a homeland. It lay outside the walls of the stifled, strangled town, in the fragrant brushwood of the hills, in the waves of the sea, under free skies and in the custody of love. And it was to this, their lost home, toward happiness, they longed to return, turning their backs disgustedly on all else. As to what that exile and that longing for reunion meant, Rear had no idea. But as he walked ahead, jostled on all sides, accosted now and then, and gradually made his way into less crowded streets, he was thinking it has no importance whether such things have or have not a meaning. All we need consider is the answer given to men's hope. Henceforth he knew the answer, and he perceived it better now he was in the outskirts of town. In almost empty streets, those 
who, clinging to their little own, had set their hearts solely on returning to the home of their love, had sometimes their reward, though some of them were still walking the streets alone, without the one they had awaited. <clears throat> then again, those were happy who had not suffered a twofold separation, like some of us who, in the days before the epidemic, had failed to build their love on a solid basis at the outset, and had spent years blindly groping for the pact, so slow and hard to come by, that in the long run binds together ill-assorted lovers. Such people had had, like Rear himself, the rashness of counting overmuch on time, and now they were parted forever. But others, like Rumbert, to whom the doctor had said early that morning, Courage, it's up to you now to prove you're right, had, without faltering, welcomed back the loved one who they thought was lost to them. And for some time, anyhow, they would be happy. They knew now that if there is one thing one can always yearn for, and sometimes attain, it is human love. But for those others who aspired beyond and above the human individual towards something they could not even imagine, there had been no answer. Taru might seem to have won through to that hardly come by peace of which he used to speak, but he had found it only in death too late to turn it to account. If others, however, Ryu could see them in the doorways of houses, passionately embracing and gazing hungrily at one another in the failing sunset glow, had got what they wanted, this was because they had asked for the one thing that depended on them solely. And as he turned the corner of the street where Grand and Cotard lived, Ryu was thinking it was only right that those whose desires are limited to man and his humble yet formidable love should enter, if only now and then, into their reward. Mm -hmm.